Together, summarising what we have done so far, a tiny fraction of our seas is protected according to the best standards of international practice. A small fraction is protected from the most damaging of fishing activities, but most marine protected areas don't qualify against international criteria for management and protection, which means that we, instead of having exceeded the UN target of 10% protection, we are way behind that curve as yet. So what can we do? Well, actually, it's, it's not that hard to fix things. A simple policy shift could rescue the network. And what we need to do is to afford protection to whole ecosystems and sites rather than focusing on bits of them and uh, on very low levels of protection. We should properly resource that management uh, and ensure that there's sufficient surveillance and enforcement. And instead of setting targets for nature to fulfill, like staying in the same state, let's give nature the protection that it needs and let it dictate what comeback is possible. And by doing that, we will have an internationally successful network of marine protected areas that will be at the forefront of conservation practice, not just in Europe, but in the whole world. So instead of being an embarrassment, our national network of marine protected areas could be something to be absolutely proud of. So at this point, I want to hand over to Hugo Tagholm from Surface Against Sewage. Thank you. Thank you, Callum. Um, and thank you, Lewis, um, for inviting um, Surface Against Sewage to be part of this amazing challenge. Uh, I'm Hugo Tagholm. I run the charity Surface Against Sewage. Um, over the past 30 years, the time that Lewis has been swimming the oceans, uh, the charity has grown from a single-issue pressure group into one of the UK's best-known marine conservation charities, representing anyone and everyone who loves the ocean, not just surfers. Um, the charity is perhaps one of the most authentic voices of the sea due to the visceral and passionate connection our community has with the oceans and the beaches around the UK. So close is this connection with the ocean that I often hear them described as the canary in the coal mine of the issues we work on. They are marine indicator species themselves. They're people who live and breathe the ocean and they have a regular, if not daily, interaction with water, just like Lewis. Um, and plastic pollution is currently our priority focus. Um, plastic's an extraordinary material, flexible, colourful, light, abundant and almost indestructible. It has had an impact on every industry and revolutionised the very way that we live. It has helped us explore the furthest reaches of the planet from the deepest ocean trenches to the highest mountain ranges and even beyond our atmosphere through space travel. But plastic's also an extraordinary pollutant, flexible, colourful, light, abundant and almost indestructible. The very properties that make it so useful also make it so problematic when it escapes into the environment. The ocean can often be the final destination for plastic waste, carried by winds, streams, rivers, currents into oceanic whirlpools of plastic. Indeed, it seems increasingly unlikely that a pristine, plastic-free environment today truly exists on any part of planet ocean. As Jacques Cousteau said, water and air, the two essential fluids on which all life depends, have become global garbage cans. However, plastic is also becoming an extraordinary unifier. The very properties which make it so useful and so problematic, its durability, its lightweight, its colourfulness, make it the pollutant that everyone can see understand and react to in their everyday lives. The millions of tonnes of plastic that enter our oceans annually are the same as the millions of tonnes of plastic that people interact with every day in our shops, in our restaurants, in our homes and in our offices. The tide line on most beaches usually has the same plastic brand profile as the high street. Immediately recognisable to anyone taking part in a beach clean, 
This jetsam is a warning sign of a failing linear economy, excessive packaging, unnecessary plastics, poor resource management and fragmented recycling systems. Scenes of beaches, cities and wilderness choked with plastic have also generated a tidal wave of community action. Again, to quote Jacques Cousteau, the sea, the great unifier, is man's only hope. Now, as never before, the old phrase has a literal meaning. We are all in the same boat. Surface Against Sewage collaborates with over 75,000 community beach clean volunteers annually. Now the biggest community of beach cleaners in the UK and one of the biggest in the world and will continue to tackle plastic pollution at the front line where land and sea converge interlocked by a swathe of plastic. But we know we can't simply pick our way out of the problem. Whilst we are committed to removing and recycling as much plastic as we can from our beaches, every piece removed a victory in its own right. We also now need to focus upstream efforts in the war on avoidable plastics. Our army of beach cleaners is being augmented on a new front in our villages, in our towns and in our cities through our Plastic Free Communities campaign. And Plastic Free Communities is a movement designed to unite and empower people to reduce their collective plastic footprint. It's the only step-by-step -step community framework inspired by the fair trade movement, uniting individual schools, business and community groups, local government and national government to tackle avoidable single-use plastics. In the process, we're also seeing local economic and community regeneration. The campaign's been a huge success since its launch just 11 months ago. Over 350 communities signed up to the process, representing 25 million people working towards this plastic-free status, both nationally and internationally. After all, the majority of the plastic pollution that we're finding on our coastline is avoidable or recyclable. Straws, stirrers, plastic bottles, plastic bags, disposable lighters, and much more. These all have solutions upstream to pre prevent their presence on our beaches. This is what Plastic Free Communities is designed to do. The time for action is now and it's up to us all not to kick the plastic bottle down the street. We can all join a beach clean or be part of a plastic free community. Industry must use plastic free policies to drive um, market advantage and respond to the global growing community that demands it. A, con a consumer revolt is, is underway against unnecessary plastics and I urge us all to take action. We'll be organising beach cleans as part of the long swim um, with Speedo and with Lewis. Um, and we'll be doing those from tomorrow in Marazion, um, down in Cornwall at 10am. And I'd like to thank Lewis and Speedo and all of the, the participants um, for the opportunity to work together on this huge issue that threatens all of our oceans and all of our marine protected areas. Thank you. Good, thank you very, very much. Um, we now open up the floor to any questions. Great. Um, so we went down to the University of Portsmouth yesterday and met a man called Professor Tipton, who is one of the world's leading experts, uh, and he put me through some tests. Um, a normal male of my uh, size will be uh, consuming about 2,500 a day. Uh, if I swim for about two hours a day, I'll be up to 5,000 calories. And if I do, uh, which I'm what I'm hoping towards the end of the swim, I'm hoping to do about three hours on. And then in the evening, another three hours, I'll be close to 10,000 calories a day. And so I'll spend a lot of day eating and swimming. No, not yet. Hi, Emily. Hi, Lewis. Um, can you just tell me how different this is going to be from the swims you've done before and in what ways? Yes, that's great. So for, for the last couple of years, I've been swimming in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And these are short swims, obviously, because the water is so extremely cold. And these are swims for about a kilometer, and I'm in the water for up to 23 minutes. And they require me to sprint as fast as I can to be able to survive in the water. 
be under no illusion that when you dive into the Arctic or the Antarctic, you are on the edge of death. Uh, and also, there are serious predators in the water. I just come back from doing that swim in South Georgia, where you have enormous great elephant seals everywhere. You have leopard seals, you have fur seals. Up in the Arctic, you've got polar bears, you've got walruses. It is, it is a very, very dangerous swim. This swim, on the other hand, is the longest swim which I will ever have attempted. Uh, and it requires a completely different mindset. I was just saying to a friend last night, I was explaining the Admiral Stockdale principle. You, you may have heard of it. Admiral Stockdale was the highest ranking American aviator shot down in Vietnam. He spent eight years in a prison of war camp. And he said that there was a paradox about those people who survived. He said, on the one hand, those people who survived, they believed that one day they would be free. But the paradox was that they had no optimism, no hope. Because those people who had hope said that, okay, come Christmas and we'll be freed. And Christmas came and they weren't freed. Okay, come Christmas, come Easter, and hopefully we'll be freed. And Easter came and they weren't freed. What about Thanksgiving? And so they were constantly believing and hoping that they'd be freed and they weren't. And it dashed all their hopes and those were the people who didn't survive. So the people who survived had that raw reality. They believed that one day they would be free, but they didn't have any hope. And uh, there's a paradox. I mean, the world is divided between pi pioneers, and swim uh, pioneers and followers. You're either a pioneer or you're a follower. Nobody has ever attempted to swim anywhere close to this distance before. And so there's nobody I can ask for advice from. And on the one hand, I... I know that I will get to Dover. I know that I will see the White Cliffs of Dover. But the paradox is, I just don't know how. I, you know, and it's easy enough to say, okay, Lewis, you know, you break the swim down into manageable chunks and you just swim each day, but the human mind just doesn't work like that. I'm worried about tomorrow. I'm worried about next week. And actually, I'm also worried about next month swimming. Mike Tyson always used to say, everybody has got a plan until they get punched in the face. And it's, it, it's so true. You know, everybody is saying to me, well, Lewis, you just swim 10 kilometers a day and you just keep on going and keep on going until you swim into your first bloom of jellyfish, until the boat has a problem, until you've got problems with the crew and they're saying, Lewis, are you sure you can do this? And it's about holding all this stuff together with one common vision, and that is we are going to Dover, and we're going to Dover because we've got a reason to get to Dover. It is, I don't use this word lightly, but it is shocking that a country which portrays itself as an ocean leader has only protected, fully protected, just seven square kilometers out of 750,000 square kilometers. And it is also, it is deeply disturbing that the single most important part of British soil, which is South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands, the single most important, from a biodiversity point of view, single most important area, less than 2% of it is fully protected. We can do better and we must do better. Yes. Short answer, yes. Um, you can get your body right, but ultimately it's going to be the, the heart that's going to get me to Dover. It's, uh, it's going to be an enormous physical journey and it's going to be an enormous mental journey. And as I said, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I hope to be here 50 days from now explaining how I did it. Radio. Um, just a question more on the sort of conservation aspect. Um, I know you mentioned uh, the government involvement in this. So, have you and your team had any involvement with sort of consulting on any new policies? I mean, particularly with Brexit on the horizon, sort of any new fisheries or marine policies in, in that area? 
So, so let me quickly talk about Brexit. I'm the uh, UN ambassador for the oceans. Um, I need to be neutral. I need to be independent. I need to be non-aligned. I'm, I, I know that there are, it is a very divisive issue here in the United Kingdom. Uh, and um, I, I, I prefer not to speak about, about Brexit. What, what I will say is that when it comes to the oceans, I would have been arguing that we needed to be properly protecting our oceans, whether Brexit was happening or it wasn't happening. Uh, with respect to dealing with the government, uh, I've had regular meetings with Michael Gove to talk about, about what we need to do. He was scheduled to be here today, but uh, unfortunately it was a very, very busy day. Hello, Tim. I can't, uh, I can't, like 300, um, 350 so kilometers. But one of the problems um, of your profession is the loneliness that belongs to the swimmer while you're a mother. Yes. On that journey, you've had quite a lot of people come to swim with you. Yes. Are you going to have that this time? I hope so, but just bearing in mind... There are three big bays in which we have to cross. So the uh, apologies, I just had to remember the name of it. Mounts Bay over here, the bay in front of Plymouth, and then obviously Lyme Bay over here. And across these bays, we will be very, very far out at sea. And so these bays will take a few days to cross. So I'll be swimming for three, four hours, GPSing the point, coming back to a harbour then later on in the evening to get the second tide going out there and coming back. So along those sections, it's not really possible for, to interact with the public. But when we pass, when we get to, uh, towards the Isle of Wight, when we get to Bournemouth, then I'll be hugging the coast. And as far as I'm concerned, I would absolutely love members of the public to come and swim with me. I want this to be a people's swim. Yes, I, I don't know if you saw the Sky News documentary last night, uh, which there's a Royal Navy uh, captain uh, who has been advising us on this. And it's especially the headlands, where you've got the fast tides moving, and especially around here, Anvil Point and the, the, these headlands over here, as you approach the Isle of Wight, which are, which are treacherous. So the, the, the tides move through there very, very quickly, uh, in fact, you have whirlpools there, you have eddies. When you have the winds moving in one direction and the tide moving in the other direction, you can have absolutely treacherous seas. So that section is an area which I'm very worried about. The other section I'm worried about is that apparently from Weymouth all the way through to Plymouth, it is now, because of the warm water, completely full with jellyfish. Yep. And there's no easy way of navigating your way through jellyfish especially if you're swimming at night. Yeah. I've <laughs> Tim is laughing because Tim was with me when I swam down the Thames and late one night he had to take me to Oxford Hospital. He had to take me to another hospital just ingesting... Uh, pollution. I've only ever been sick on two swims, both of them, or three swims, and all three of them were swimming in rivers. I think I'm going to be okay swimming out at sea, but, but who knows. I can't. <laughs> I, I don't want to speak on behalf of Michael. You know, I, I'm sure you, you've listened to him speak. He, um, when it comes to the oceans, he is 
you know, his, his father and his grandfather were both involved in the oceans. He speaks very, very passionately about what he feels we need to do with the oceans. All I would say is this. Um, the United Kingdom has the opportunity now to be a world leader in ocean conservation. I would urge him to, to grab this opportunity with both hands. Thomas, I'm the UN ambassador. I, uh, I need to be diplomatic about this, but at, this, at, the, at the same time, we also need to be realists. Yep. I mean, I, I've been swimming, as I say, for 30 years, and it's a very, very small time in ecological times. And, and the changes have been absolutely dramatic. I've explained what I saw in the Arctic. Um, Ten years ago, I was swimming across the Maldives, across the coral reefs there, and it's just, it was so wonderful to swim across those coral reefs. You look underneath you, and it's like swimming onto the set of Nemo, beautiful tropical fish, the colors, the vibrancy, the sharks, the, the, the turtles, everything. I went back there last year, and it was like swimming over rubble. The water temperature has risen just a bit, and everything has died. You go down to Antarctica, go down to a place like uh, Deception Island and swim across Deception Island. Underneath you are all these whale bones, whale bones upon whale bones upon whale bones from when the great whalers came in there and literally destroyed that place. And so we've seen the great big industrial fishing fleets. First they came for the seals and then they came for the whales and now they're coming for the Antarctic toothfish and they're even coming for the tiniest life on earth, krill, on which every single thing in the southern ocean survives. And you just see this and you realize that, that unless we take action right now, that the future for our oceans is, is, is not a bright one. And, and, and I feel that the United Kingdom is perfectly placed as a maritime nation, as a G7 nation, as the currently running the presidency of Chogham to lead the world on these issues. And I would really encourage them to. The single most important thing now for the new foreign secretary is properly protecting the South Sandwich Islands. This has gone on far too long. It's gone on far too long. You know, some of the best scientific advice was adduced to Boris Johnson. Scientists from many different uh, universities explained to him exactly why this place needs protecting. South Georgia, South Sandwich Islands are like the Serengeti of the Southern Ocean. There's a reason why Blue Planet you know, films so much down there, because this place is so very, very important. Uh, and that's, I would, I would argue, one of the most important things now on his agenda as he now takes office. Yeah. It's very, very interesting because, thank you, Paul, uh, because nobody's ever done a swim like this before, you, you just don't know quite how much training you should do. You know, using a steak analogy, should you go in there rare, medium rare, medium, medium well done, well done. I think that I, what, what we decided was I should go in there medium rare. Uh, and the reason for that is because uh, I've got 50 days of swimming ahead of me and I wanted to arrive on the start line as relaxed and not mentally tired. So I've been swimming around about seven kilometers a day. I started my training down in the Falkland Islands and I've spent the last six months training off the Cape of Good Hope in rough cold seas. Um, and so I feel ready, but I'm gonna get fitter and fitter as this event carries on. Okay. Good. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to Thank you all very, very much for coming here today and a huge thank you to FXTM and to Speedo for your very, very generous help with this expedition. I wouldn't be able to do it without you and I want to thank you very, very much. Thank you.